So real simple, you know, leadership from, from Lopez, uh, based on my, the recent study of Mission Command, is um, build teams through mutual trust, communicate, which is talking and listening, and then empowering our subordinates to, to grow and develop their initiative. Those are kind of my, my three big points. Welcome to episode four of the One Life Podcast. I'm your host, Devin Rodriguez. And our goal with this show is to enable and empower you to discover who you are so that you can take full advantage of the one life you have to live. Today's guest is Army Colonel Eric Lopez. Colonel Lopez attended the United States Military Academy and graduated in 1996 with a degree in European history. Upon graduating from West Point, Colonel Lopez developed, commissioned as a second lieutenant into the United States Infantry. From there, he became a platoon leader in both the conventional army and also in the historic and prolific Army Ranger Regiment. In fact, he's had multiple stints with the Army Ranger Regiment over the course of his military career. In total, Colonel Lopez is an experienced combat leader with seven combat tours to Iraq and, Af and Afghanistan. Colonel Lopez has successfully completed military training in multiple Army schools, including Ranger, Sapper, Air Assault, and Airborne. And over the course of his career, He's earned four bronze stars. Currently, Colonel Lopez is serving as the brigade commander of the 3rd Recruiting Brigade, which is headquartered in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And it is really a true privilege for me, especially as a young infantry officer, to have Colonel Lopez on our podcast. So, sir, I really appreciate you coming on, and I really look forward to our conversation. So thank you very much. Great. Devin, thanks for having me, and I appreciate what you're doing with this podcast. So look forward to it. Thanks a lot, sir. So I'd just like to start off with uh, having you describe for us, who were you growing up? And if you could just share your story with my audience, just so we can get uh, a little bit more perspective into who Colonel Lopez is, not only now, but in the past as well. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, a very diverse environment, uh, and, and grew up with some, some great friends, a great family. Um, and uh, my parents were musicians. So uh, my mom was an elementary school music teacher and my dad uh, was a, a professional singer. And, uh, and, and so I grew up in a musical family and I was a, a long way from, uh, from an army, which you'd call a typical army family. Um, I also had a great influ influence on my life from my grandparents. My, my grandparents on my mom's side were missionaries in China and Taiwan uh, for 48 years. So I had an incredible godly legacy and example from them that I grew up with. And, and they were retired at the time as I was growing up and, and I got to spend time with them. Um, so I grew up, you know, uh, did, did okay in school, uh, played all the sports, uh, was in the, you know, student government, did all those things. But I'll, I'll tell you, the real transformation moment for me was when I watched the movie Platoon. And I, I watched that movie, which, uh, which won uh, Best Picture back in the, uh, the mid-80s. And I, I looked at the lieutenant in that, in that movie, this sort of hapless, you know, weak lieutenant who couldn't control his platoon. And, and, and the platoon started to do some, some bad things, some immoral things. And when I watched that movie, I said, I want to be that lieutenant. I didn't really know much about the military or the army or anything. But that challenge, when I saw it, I said, if my generation goes to war, I want to be that lieutenant. And, and from there, kind of progressed. My dad took me to a, uh, a West Point um, forum where they had a cadet that was coming to talk about West Point. So I got really interested and uh, started to go through the application process. Ultimately got accepted and, and uh, in 1992, was a freshman, a plebe at West Point, and that kind of started my Army journey. So then, sir, I, I wanted to, to dive in a little, uh, a little more deeply into some of your experiences. Um, so obviously, you went through West Point. You were successful there, as you shared with me prior. I, I know that a lot of my friends would appreciate this. You earned your Sapper tab in West Point. So I know that, that that's a pretty cool thing to do, uh, definitely a really cool thing to do. But I want to go a little deeper in. One of my instructors at St. John's, he was an Army Ranger as well. Um, Jonathan Alexander, Master Sergeant Jonathan Alexander now. But he always talked to me about the Army Rangers be, being a place where 
one would go if he wants to really exceed and push himself to a limit each and every day you showed up because every day there's no guarantee of you keeping your job. So I want, if you could just talk a little bit about your experience being in the Ranger Regiment, what it was like, and not only that, but talk a little bit about what you witnessed that was different about the people in the Ranger Regiment. Because I think it's a, it's a really interesting mindset to look into. Sure. Now let, let's go back. You said I was a successful cadet. I'm not sure that is totally accurate. Uh, I was in survival mode at West Point. I was just trying to make it through to the next day, keep my head above water. I wasn't a super stellar cadet. Uh, I was trying to survive. So, so the message is, you know, sometimes you, you might be frustrated or you might feel like everybody else is doing better, but uh, hang in there, you know, hang in there. Some people are, are late bloomers. Um, and, and I guess I'd, I'd call myself a late, a late bloomer. I really struggled at, at West Point. Uh, but when I got to, to Ranger School, I got a great piece of advice. And somebody told me, focus on getting your Ranger buddy their Ranger tab and your journey through Ranger School will take care of itself. And that's what I did all throughout Ranger School is I thought, what can I do to take care of my Ranger buddy to make sure he gets his Ranger tab? And that would, when I was tired, when I didn't want to do anything else, I would go above and beyond because I wanted my buddy to get their tab. And then it ended up taking care of myself. I ended up being the undergraduate of Ranger Class 397. And it was a, a lot of it because of that advice. And it was, it was my ability to, to learn early to put your, your peers, your subordinates, put other people before yourself. Put the team before yourself. Put the needs of others before your own needs. And that's going to take care of, of you if you, you always keep that model of, of being a servant. And uh, I think that served me really well in Ranger School. Uh, in 1998, I, I showed up at 1st Ranger Battalion, and the battalion commander was Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Votel, who went on to become the CENTCOM commander and retired as, as a four-star general. That organization was absolutely an incredible organization. It is the organization that made me who I am today. I can still hear my NCOs' voices in my head when I want to sleep in and not do PT, when I take, want to take a shortcut, when I want to, you know, not do the right thing or, or take the easier way instead of the right way, the harder way. My NCOs, um, Staff Sergeant Fernandez, uh, Sergeant Rovira, Staff Sergeant Pugh, Staff Sergeant Roberts, those guys are the voice inside my head that tells me, Eric, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to live the Ranger Creed and, um, and you're supposed to do the right thing. And I've kept that with me through my entire career. And, and what makes that organization special is they really do live by a creed. That Ranger Creed and all the paragraphs are, are inculcated in the organization. And that's what makes that organization great. And I was so proud to be a part of it. So then, sir, uh, next question would be to kind of uh, build off of that, as you said, that a piece of advice you got going into Ranger School, I mean, that's, I think that'll be helpful for not only myself, but some of my friends as well, um, about the piece where you said that it was your job to get your buddy through Ranger School as well. So how has that, how have you taken that from, from Ranger School and then applied that to the rest of your life? So I feel like that's a, really a leadership philosophy in itself. So how have you take that and then even in your own job right now, for example, sir, how have you applied that to just all aspects of your life in, in general? It, it absolutely is. And, and it's absolutely what makes the Army and serving in the Army special. So I'm going to uh, put my recruiter badge on here and, and just talk about, you know, one of the things when we go out into the American public and we talk about why moms and dads out there should send their, their young men and women into the army, that's one of the main reasons because that's how we operate. We operate where the first thing you're taught is you put the needs of the team before your own needs. Where else in our society does that happen? Where else in our society are you told to put everybody else before yourself? 
it's the opposite in, in most of society. It's all about, hey, it's all about me. How do I get promoted? How do I, how do I, uh, how do I develop? How do I get that uh, more money, that next step? But in the Army, we are fundamentally focused on the needs of the team before my own needs. And, and um, that's how I've, I've operated my whole career and uh, I've always tried, tried to do that. And it's always served me well. I think it's one of the core foundations of our organization. Thanks for sharing that, sir. I mean, I've even in ROTC, as I was sharing with you before the, uh, we initially started this, like my experience, my first couple of years was a little rough because I was kind of not doing the opposite, but I wasn't really putting others before me because I was so focused on just making sure that I was performing to a certain standard and a certain level. And I was telling everybody else that they should be at the same level, but I wasn't showing them the way to get there. So I think I really like what you're saying about that because it's a lot of it, I think goes back to leading by example is um, something that I really hear in your voice right now. And certainly at Ranger School. And did you notice that as you were constantly worrying about other people, did other people seem to pick up on that a little bit? And was it, did it develop any type of culture or, or was it more individualized with each and every person? It's pretty individual, man. I mean, the people's true colors are going to come out at Raider School, but it, it definitely can spread as, as you start to um, care about, you know, one guy, then he takes care of the next guy and, and you build that trust in the organization. Um, that's, it's it's infectious. It's infectious, and it's uh, it can spread through the organization, and you can get a a uh, an organization that really functions well as a team. Now, I won't say my Ranger platoon was uh, was an all star cast and we got everything right, but uh, there definitely were some of us that 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 subscribed to the mentality of uh, putting your Ranger buddy before yourself. Right. And like you said, it served you so well in, in all areas of your life ever since you, you really started to adopt it. And the next thing I, I want to discuss goes back to, I think that in society, we always hear that we are really working for our bosses. And I was watching one of your, one of your um, YouTube videos and you actually talked about that, uh, do what your boss tells you, but I kind of want to reverse it a little bit. But as I, if I'm a subordinate in military terms, or if I'm an employee working for a manager, how do I really influence my boss to do what I want them to do without overtly coming out and saying, you do this. So how do I essentially lead up the chain of command? Um, Cause I think that's something that can help a lot of young leaders if they can understand that concept. Absolutely. And, and you hit on a little bit and I, I did a YouTube video on it, but it, it starts with doing what your boss says. Your boss is hungry for people who will just do what they're told. Uh, regardless of how you feel about it. So start with that. That's the, that's the ground level is do what your boss says. The next step is you got to start to think like your boss. If you're going to influence your boss, you got to understand how your boss thinks. Uh, and that's really commander's intent. That's what we call it in the army is commander's intent. Do you really understand your boss's commander's intent for how they want to operate and their guidance for very specific situations? And then once you've done those two things, once you've earned your boss's trust by always doing what they say, by understanding how your boss is thinks, then you can start to think for your boss. You can start to bring your boss ideas that are your ideas and say, hey boss, hey sir, hey ma'am, you know, I was thinking maybe the company could do something like this or, or how about this idea or hey, here's a brainstorm that my platoon had or that my subordinate unit had and I want to bring you that now a, a lot of the times is the current generation the generation Z and the, the Millennials they want to start with that they want to come in day one and say hey I got these great ideas because you know what they do have great ideas they think so much faster than the Gen Xers they intake so much more information than the uh, than the older generations so they do have great ideas but sometimes you can't give those great ideas on day one. Sometimes you got to do what your boss says, earn their trust, think like your boss. Then you can think for your boss and bring, those, bring them those ideas. So that's the best way to manage up is to follow those three steps. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, that was something that was repeated repeated to me too in, in my time in ROTC was you want to get to that point where you're thinking for the boss. And I was the battalion commander, for example, in ROTC. And one of the areas in which I kind of failed at and which you, you kind of alluded to was that I had all of these, these things in my head that I wanted to bring to the table immediately, but I wasn't really focusing on what the immediate priorities of my lieutenant colonel uh, at my ROTC program, I wasn't really focusing on his priorities. So I felt like there, they were not at odds, but I was focusing on things right. that n weren't necessarily his priorities. So then to go a little deeper into it, if I'm, if I'm in a meeting with my supervisor or my company commander or battalion commander, my boss, what kind of questions should I be asking in order to make sure that I am prioritizing correctly? Because I, like I said, I know that's somewhere that I failed and maybe other young leaders are failing at as well. I think a big way to do it is that, that confirmation brief. That's what we have as part of our troop leading procedures and as part of our military decision-making process is that confirmation brief. So as soon as the boss, whoever that boss is, civilian, you know, battalion commander, company commander, gives you the order, you just read back to them uh, what they told you to do. And you will find out as, as you know, this has happened to me a lot, when I, have, when I have my folks give me a back brief on what I just told them, you, it takes a little bit of back and forth to truly level the bubbles on this is what I really want you to do. So I think that confirmation brief is a huge way to go, hey, ma'am, you know what? I just heard you say you want me to do A, B, and C. And she might say, no, I told you A, D, and F. Then you recalibrate, ma'am, I heard you say A, D, and F. Yes, roger that. Okay, move out and, and go get it done. The other piece I, I think is just communicating uh, and acknowledging that, that you are listening, that you are listening to what they say and that what they said has been heard, that, that you truly understand it. And I think that um, the affirmation in the listening process, in the communi communication process, is, is really vital to that two-way communication. So, sir, I, I think that uh, it's applicable, like, like you said, it's not, a lot of the time people hear the military jargon and they think it's so specific to military, but like you said, it would be a lot easier if we could just ask our bosses if this, if sir, ma'am, or John, you know, Josephine, whatever, is this what actually what you wanted? So then it takes out all the ambiguity and then correct me if I'm wrong, you don't bring back your boss something that they didn't want in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it could save a lot of time. This is also very applicable in marriage, okay? My wife and I do a lot of uh, kind of marriage mentoring and, and we taught one, uh, marriage Sunday school at church. And we always do a drill when you have that kind of that hot topic, that contentious topic between a husband uh, and a wife or between the, uh, the two spouses um, where one spouse says, this is how I feel. And the other spouse, all they're doing is saying, I hear you saying this and making sure that you are truly saying the, the, the right thing and you're hearing what they're saying. And that's a huge part of communication, whether it's at, at work, whether it's in the army or whether it's in marriage. Right. So it just, it, it's just good in all different aspects of communication and it's effective, like you're saying, sir. So the next thing I, I, I think is interesting, everybody has such different definitions for leadership and how they view leadership, you know, transformational leadership, servant leadership, uh, transactional leadership. So I know that you have started Lopez on leadership in which you personally share a lot of leadership advice for young leaders such as myself and leaders just at all different levels. So for you personally, what are, what are your core and foundational leadership principles that you embody and that you live by that have enabled you to be in the position where you are now? Yeah, it's a journey, Devin, and, I, and I'll tell you, I, I got three points here for you, but, but I, really, I really just thought about this in the last couple of weeks. I'm working on a, a five-part YouTube series on Mission Command and sort of how it's evolved and what it really means to, to our young leaders out there. And as I did that, I saw that, and, and I love Mission Command. I think Mission Command is a, is a great model for leadership. And I think when you really boil down Mission Command, it comes down to three things. The first one is you have to build team through mutual trust. That's 
caring for your folks, but that's also challenging them. That's, that's doing those things that are so hard as you train that it, it bonds you as a team. And, and always figuring out how can I build a team, because I know if I have a team that trusts each other, we can accomplish any mission. It doesn't matter if the army tells us to go to Bosnia or Africa or, or uh, it, to deal with the COVID crisis or wildfires or anything, we have a team that trusts each other, we can accomplish any mission. So that, that's step one, build teams uh, that have a mutual trust. Step two is communication. Every after action review, every you know, time we look at ourselves, we say, you know what, I could have communicated better. And guess what, that's two way communication. That's not just talking, that's listening. How do you communicate? How do you send a message to your organization and receive feedback and input? A lot of us think it's just one way. We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So how do we communicate? And, and if you know me, I love to communicate and flatten the organization through communicating through social media. And I think we've got to do a better job of that in the future as, as Army leaders. Um, and, the, and the last thing is empower our subordinates. In everything we do, seeking to empower our subordinates so they can make decisions at their own level. That's putting authority down for them to make decisions and pulling risk up and putting risk on our back. What we usually like to do is we like to give our subordinates all the risk and we take the authority to make the decision. And that's not the way it should be. So real simple, you know, leadership from, from Lopez uh, based on my, the recent study of Mission Command is um, build teams through mutual trust, communicate, which is talking and listening, and then empowering our subordinates to, to grow and develop their initiative. Those are kind of my, my three big points. Sir, thanks a lot. And the one thing that I want to dive a little more uh, deeply into is the fact about empowering your subordinates. So I know that a big concern when empowering your subordinates, you said that the risk is much higher uh, because you are giving that authority to them uh, to make decisions on their level and, and it can have effects on the organization as a whole. And, and as a leader, like you're saying, you accept those risks. At what point do you say, okay, now I have to manage a little more, or okay, now right. I could take the reins off and you can have more responsibility. So does it start off at a, at, a, at a point where it's you're over the person and you're checking everything that they're doing? Or how do you get to the point where you can loosen the reins on the person and say, now you have a lot more free reign to do what you, to make more decisions? Yeah, you're hitting on a great point, Devin. And, and the bottom line is it's a spectrum. You're going to always be operating on that spectrum. Over here is command and control. I issue clear an order, and I ensure that order is followed. Over here is more of that mission command side. I issue clear guidance, and I empower the initiative. This side is the science. This side is the art. And as leaders, we're always going to be moving back and forth based on trust and risk. So you get a brand new person in your organization, you don't trust them. You don't know them you're probably gonna start over here, a little bit more on the science side, a little bit more on the issue and order, and sure that that order is followed. If you've got a person that you trust, that you know is squared away, you're gonna operate over here, and you're gonna give them clear guidance, and you're gonna let them figure it out. The situation can also change, right? And also determine where you are in the spectrum. If you've been walking on a, on a 30 mile road march, you're in the woods, the temperature just dropped and it started raining, you're probably going to start to move over to this side and, and take a little bit more control of the situation because the risk is going up. I talked about trust and risk, right? Now the risk goes up. I'm going to go a little bit more this way. So as leaders, it's never fixed. It's always moving, but we always want to move to the side of mission command, to the side of issuing clear guidance and empowering our subordinates to make decisions but it's okay and command and control is a vital part of mission command but we operate on that spectrum that's that's the way i look at it All right so then sir i want to one up one more follow-up question for this then so do you think because i i've read a few books uh, i read quite a few books but one of the things that i've, I've talked about and i learned through rotc is 
in order to build that trust and to make the subordinate feel empowered, maybe give them a task which is important, but it won't have catastrophic res uh, effects if they fail it. You know, if they fail, it's okay, that's fine because it doesn't have a big impact. But at the same time, if they succeed, they prove that maybe they could have a little bit more on their plate. So in the instance like you're talking about, someone new comes into the organization, obviously they have to do what you say and you're gonna have much more tight, you're gonna have tighter control, maybe micromanage it a little bit more. Um, but do you think it's a good idea to start, start small, obviously, and then work up to those bigger tasks? Absolutely, and you're always looking for opportunities to give them more, to give them more, to give them more, to, to grow. Um, and you're always, as a leader, always looking for opportunities to take tasks from you and get them out with clear guidance so other people can, uh, can be a key part of it. And that's the delegation piece. Micromanagers want to keep everything to themselves. They want to do everything themselves. And then they get frustrated because they can't do it all. And they take it out on their subordinates. Instead of delegating with clear task and purpose and then elevating the importance of that, I think is a great point And I think some of all leaders can, can work on. So then you also just said something that I find uh, rather interesting, sir, and it was the fact that clear and concise guidance and the delegation part of it. I feel I found myself at certain points wanting to do everything at one time because I felt that if I gave it to other people, maybe, and it goes back to the trust piece, it maybe it won't get done or it'll get done, but maybe not to the level that I want to. So then how do I get to the point where it's, okay, I trust you to take this task but then also giving them guidance where there's, there's no ambiguity. They know what their left and right limits yeah. are. Cause I feel like sometimes the message could get missed in the process. So you, you want to give guidance in your commander's intent that is all encompassing. There's a difference between overall guidance and specific tasks, right? We give specific tasks and tasks to subordinate units, but you want that intent to be to to allow them to make decisions no matter what happens and, and you want it to be simple you want it to be clear i'll give you an example i was the brigade dco for second brigade 101st and we had done some great training but we were getting to the point where the um the rest of the brigade was about to redeploy and the brigade commander was going to come back and and i said you know what our guidance for this period of time for this quarter is green and clean Three words, three word guidance, green and clean. That means I want to be green on all our statistics, all our uh, stats, all our medical, all our, our med pros, all our dental, all that stuff. And I want to be clean. I want to repaint everywhere. I said, look, I don't want us to train right now. Here's the priority. We already did the training. We're going to take this quarter. We're going to slow down. We're going to be green and clean. That way, when the brigade comes back, we know we're going to start running again. And the people that were here at Fort Campbell are, are green, clean, and they're ready to go. That was simple guidance. Three words, it rhymed, and you would hear people yelling, hey, sir, green and clean, green and clean. And, and when it becomes a joke and people start, like, you know, making fun of it, and then you know that they really got it. You really know that it's taken over the whole organization. So, And in that guidance, they could make all kinds of decisions. Should we, should we clean this first? Should we? paint that should we reorganize this or let's get in the supply room or hey we need to go out and shoot our our weapons to get qualified or i didn't have to tell them do this 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 i said hey i want you green and clean you guys figure it out and that's what the difference is between guidance and between given specific tasks right right i think that makes a lot of sense is allow because i if you give too much direction in that then it kind of takes away their decision making process is what you're ultimately getting to if i if i hear you correctly sir right yeah absolutely right so then how do you i feel like as a it could be overwhelming at times as a new leader i know not saying that i necessarily have thought this way myself but it's definitely come up in a conversation with peers is you step into an organization that's been gelled and formed together they have a platoon sergeant that has plenty of experience. And here I come as a new leader, stepping in the door, ready to make change, but I don't know any of these people. So what are kind of the first steps that you think a new leader can come in and then really start to make change and affect change? Yeah, real simple acronym for you, okay? Tips, all right, tips. You come in, 
You want to make an impact? First thing you do is tips. T is talk to your subordinates. Talk to them every day. Talk to your privates. Talk to them one-on-one -on -one after PT. Talk to them during PT. Walk with them on the road marches. Sit by them at the range. Talk to your subordinates. That's one. Number two, keep them informed. You're going to get the information from higher. Do you have a way to always disseminate to keep them informed? Number three is plan. You are the planner. You're the one that's looking forward and planning for the organization. And guess what? That's not just for your soldiers. That's for their families as well. They want to know when are you going to the field? When are you, um, you know, uh, when are the big events coming up? They want to know that calendar stuff. And then lastly is the S is be sensitive to what your organization needs. That doesn't mean you go around giving everybody a hug, okay? But you gotta be sensitive. You gotta understand who needs what. You may have a soldier that needs help with finances. You might have a subordinate that needs help with their marriage. You might have a, a squad that is not physically fit and you gotta come up with a training plan um, to do that. So I would tell you, remember tips, talk, keep them informed. You're the planner, right? Plan ahead and then be sensitive and understand what your, your platoon needs. And that's a way coming in as a brand new leader, brand new platoon leader or brand new civilian to a new organization that's running that you can be value added. Yeah, I've never heard that before, sir. I think that makes a lot of sense though, because in going back to my ROTC experience, once again, because that's really all that I have to rely on, people would get so frustrated because they would find out the day prior to something that we had a, a six mile ruck march the next day. And now they have to lug their ruck from their house to campus. And then it causes X, Y, and Z problems. And now everybody's just frustrated. And now it makes the leader look like you don't really care about us because you're just telling us the day before. So yeah, that's why we make all you guys go to the, the camp here at Fort Knox. Cause all you want to know is what's next. What's next. What's next. Are we going to the NBC? I thought we were going to the NBC chamber. No, we're going to land nav. No, that changed. We're going to marksmanship. And, and that's what it feels like to be a private. So the whole point of mission command is when you get that shared understanding from top to bottom and everybody knows what's going on, then your, your, your lowest ranking person can make decisions on their own. And that's what we want. That's why shared understanding is another key principle to, to mission command that we want to have. But it comes with that, keeping them informed, talking to them, communicating, and planning. All those things are, are huge to building that trust in the organization. Now, sir, I was talking to um, another guest yesterday, and he's on the business side of things, not in the military, never served, but a lot of the things that you two are saying are very similar. And one thing that he said is that in the business world, you could essentially measure your success by how far you are detached from your subordinates, from the lowest guy. So for example, a four-star general isn't really going to be with a platoon every day doing PT. He says, but you have to make the effort to make sure that you're reaching back down to still show them that they are important and that you're not coming off as you're someone that's high and mighty. So in your position, for example, as a, a colonel who is, who is detached from a, plat a normal platoon, for example, what kind of efforts do you make to show even a, a private specialist, sergeant, people that typically you don't have to speak to on an everyday basis that you are a leader that actually cares for them and, and is there for their best interests? So first of all, you know, going out, traveling and, uh, and spending time with recruiters. Uh, they're out there, they have a tough mission and, and going out there side by side, shared hardship is always key. The other piece though is remember, I have 1500 recruiters across all our part of 16 states. I'm telling you, social media is an incredible way for me to regularly communicate and encourage all my recruiters out there. So I am connected with probably 90% of them on social media and I see what they're doing and I'll post, hey, great job. You know, muscle emoji, you know, fist bump emoji uh, or, or fire emoji. Great job. Keep it up. I'm really proud of you. And I'm able to see everything they're doing. I'm able to encourage them. And they're also able to talk to me. I get messages all the time, sir. Did you know this? This is going on. Hey, sir, can you help with this? And that communication is really flattened from the 06 level down to the recruiter level 
through social media. And, and it's not just in recruiting. I, I think we need to do a better job of using social media to do this uh, in the operational army. I did it as a battalion commander. I had a, a Facebook page as a battalion commander. It was my call sign, Ramrod 6. So it was the Ramrod 6 Facebook page. I had all the spouses on there. I had all the soldiers on there. And it, it was a great way for me to communicate with them and for them to communicate directly with me. And I would tell the spouses, you are not allowed to complain about anything in this battalion unless you have written me. And if you do, I will take care of it in 24 hours. And that was a great policy and it helped our spouses feel like we cared about them. And they brought up great ideas all the time. They brought up great ideas to me on Facebook and we would dive in and try to fix them. So I think social media is a great way to bridge that gap from the highest uh, down to uh, some of the subordinate level leaders. I think that is such an unconventional yet futuristic approach, sir. And that is, that's really something to think about because I feel like the military could do a much better job of utilizing social media. And like you were saying, I'm sure that must have made an impact that you had that the Facebook page. And it, it probably, I'm sure your subordinates really appreciated it. Like you were saying, it kept them up to date. It kept them informed. You cared about their families. And the fact that you said, if your wife, husband has a problem, it'll be taken care of in 24 hours. That's, that's something that I feel it could work in all different areas of life. And it's just, it would show, it, it would build such a more, uh, a greater level of trust, I feel, because it bridges the gap. It bridges the gap between right. the subordinate and the leader. And it shows that you are accessible and that you're not just someone that's on your throne, for example. Um, and that, you, like I said, you actually care about them. So I think that's a, a really interesting response in terms of social media. And sir, I, you have a, a pretty good social media following, which I think is interesting. Um, yet you're a colonel and some people may look and say, colonel must have an outdated approach to things, but obviously you don't. So how did you really like get the idea to start using social media? Because like I said, it seems like you're ahead of your time, although you're a lot more experienced than the younger leaders who seem to have the more technological approaches so I was in the army war college and I knew I was coming to take a recruiting brigade and I said man I gotta figure this out um, I'd already always been pretty big on social media but I was really very deliberate that's when I started the uh, Lopez on leadership Instagram and Lopez on leadership YouTube channel just to start to get out in the space and, and figure it out so I knew that's what my recruiters were gonna have to be doing because that's where the current generation we're trying to recruit is on social media. So we had to get good at it. So I started it in the Army War College and started to learn, learn how to, how to connect with people, how to get followers, how to post good content, um, and, and just got better and better. And so I, I have a video coming out here as part of my five-part series on Mission Command. Part five is social media and Mission Command. So be on the lookout for that coming out on Lopez on Leadership and YouTube, and I'll, I'll dive into it a lot more. Yeah, I think that's, that's such an interesting perspective on it, sir. And then, so obviously you, you took the initiative upon yourself to really learn more about it and so forth. So I want to go back to a little bit about the, the leadership and the leadership aspect of it in terms of initiative. So as a, as a senior leader, how important it is, well, let me rephrase that question. When a leader walks in the door, how important it is, is it for them to show you that they are coming forth and they aren't looking for all the answers, but instead they are showing you that initiative. Cause I think that's, um, in my, it's, for example, I, as I described to you before the show started, I went to Hawaii and I got to interact with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lee, who is a battalion commander there. And he said, initiative is one of the main things that I look for in a young leader. So for you kind of to rephrase the question, what are some of the things that you would look for in a young leader to say, this is my guy. This is the one that I can rely on that I know will get the job done and do it well. Yeah. Initiative is, is huge. And I think that's at the, the pinnacle that's at the top. So it starts with somebody I'm telling you, if you just do what your boss says, you're in the top 70%. Uh, so start off with that. And it's, it's amazing how many people, and I gave the example in the YouTube video, I said, I walk into the room and I say, everybody grab a, a notepad and a paper or take notes on your phone. And I look around the room after five minutes and you know, only 70% of the people are doing what, I, doing what I told them. It's not that hard. Start with, with doing what your boss tells you to do. 
The second thing is people who listen. The, the subordinates who, as they're talking, they're repeating back to you what you said. It's clear they understand. They were really listening attentively to what you were saying. You can distinguish yourself up a little bit higher. And then the, the pinnacle, and it's funny, it's funny, you know, you talk to that other battalion commander because that's the thing I've always said that's really going to distinguish you as a lieutenant or as a junior leader in whatever organization you're in is initiative. Who can think of original ideas on their own and make those ideas a reality, operationalize those ideas. Uh, the number of people who can really do that with that level of initiative is very few, it's very uncommon, and that's what I definitely want from my leaders. So sir, going a little deeper into the initiative part of it, does initiative mean that I develop an idea and I like the idea and then it succeeds? Or is it a matter of I have a good idea and it might fail, but I'm gonna try to implement it either way? So which of the two is it? Because I feel like a lot of leaders may think I have a really good idea, but if it fails, then I'm going to look horrible. At what point do you say, okay, I have initiative. Now let me bring it forward. And then I have faith that it'll actually work. So, so one of the things we got to do as leaders is when people do fail, we can't overreact. We can't go from mission command and swing all the way back to the other side and go back to that micromanagement piece. So we, we can't overreact. Um, I, I think it, it's not necessarily whether it failed or not. It's whether the organization learned and got better from it. If you came up with an idea, you planned, you resourced, you executed it, and it, and it kind of flopped, but you learned from it, and then you came back and did it again, and it was better, and you improved, that's probably the most important thing is did you learn from what went right and what went wrong, and did you move your organization forward and help the organization improve? Right. I think that's the difference between failure and learning from the, the mistakes that you've made in the past. But then also to go one step further. So I'm a young leader and I come in and I failed at a, a live fire exercise or something of the sort. And I made a mistake and it's clear what the mistake is. What does it tell you if, as a leader if I go out and I repeat the same mistake one time, then now I make it two times. Now it's three times. So what does that tell you? Because I've always been told, never make the same mistake twice. So as a senior leader, how do you interpret that and then take it and then say, okay, this, this officer or this person, this is my perception of him or her based off of my experiences? I, I think as a leader, you got to figure out, do they have a skill problem or do they have a will problem? If they have a skill problem, they need more training. And it's our job to, to train them and to, to show them what right looks like, to have them rehearse it and exercise it. If they have a will problem, that means something's wrong in here. Something's wrong in here. They don't believe, they're not listening, uh, they don't have the will to win, then you gotta do some serious one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, and, and probably give a pretty stern warning because if you continue to see a will issue, that's someone you cannot have in your organization. And, and you gotta start on a path to getting them out of your organization. But that analysis of skill and will is a great start. And then you can track it from there on how to develop that person. Yeah, that's so funny that you mentioned that, sir, because this entire semester of school, uh, like I said, I was the battalion commander and the lieutenant colonel who, who constantly was, I was talking to on a daily basis. We would have weekly uh, sync meetings. He, oh, he would always say when I would talk about, you know, the people in the organization, is it a matter of skill or is it a matter of will? And Basically, exactly what you said is what he would repeat to me. And I think that's a really, a really good thing to remember, skill or will, because then you can really categorize, you know, maybe this person just does, does, does not know. But as long as you take those, uh, those measures to teach them, to mentor them, to show them the way, then once they continue to not show out, then you might know that there's a deeper problem. Like you said, go into the counselings and really understand what's going on in their personal lives or whatever the case may be that's affecting them. So to go a little, not away from this topic since we're talking about leadership, but one thing that I experienced at Fort Knox, which you're, which you're at and is a very hot place, I must say, I must say um, at advanced camp, and I know West Pointers experience this as well, and I would assume combat leaders in general, but leaders as a whole, you have to make decisions 
quickly and oftentimes under a lot of stress. So as a combat leader who has all of these deployments under your belt and with the Ranger Regiment, which specializes in really close quarters combat, you've definitely experienced some of that chaos in which I have to make a decision now or in the business world, it might cost the company a, a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars or millions of dollars, but in the military, it can cost lives if yep. you don't make that decision. So how have you learned to make decisions in times of chaos? Because I think that can really help young leaders as they start to go and potentially find themselves in a position like that. Yeah. Use the systems the army gives you for these situations. I'm talking about troop leading procedures and military decision-making process. So the army has a process for crisis. It's called troop leading procedures all the way down through issuing your operations order. Use it. There's so many people that don't use the army systems that are designed for exactly that situation. Great example, here in, we had the COVID crisis. My brigade, my recruiting brigade, we're not, we have a lot of civilians on our staff. We're designed to recruit, but you know what? When COVID hit, we went through the military decision-making process. We did mission analysis. We did co-development. We did a war game. We issued an operations order. We did back briefs. And it allowed our formation to move so much faster and make decisions because we had clarity because we used the system that the army was designed for. So use the systems that are out there. That's, that's the biggest thing I would tell you. The other piece is you've got to start out from a place of humility. And you've got to start out saying, I don't know what to do. Instead of saying, okay, crisis hits, combat hits. Instead of saying, I know what to do, start out with, I don't know what to do. And in order to figure that out, I need to understand the environment, define the problem, and then come up with a solution. A lot of the mistakes I made early in my career, I, I was too prideful. And I thought, I know what to do. Situation came up, here's what we're gonna do. What I learned through all these combat deployments was to use the army design methodology. Again, it's another army system designed for this and, and very simplified. A complex problem comes up. The first thing you do is understand your environment. Then define and scope the problem. So many times we end up with a solution that doesn't match the problem on the ground. So understand the environment, define and scope the problem, then come up with a solution. And when you understand in the environment, you get input from all levels, from the lowest private, from civilians, from families. They will help you understand the environment so you can then define and scope the problem and then come up with a solution. But it starts from that place of humility of saying, I don't know what to do. Now, battle drills are a different thing. In combat, we have to have battle drills. Which that means something that we perform that takes absolutely no thought. It is a drill. Indirect fire comes in, we go into the drill and we keep people safe. Um, people start chewing at us, battle drill, react to contact. And you get that through tough training. And you get that, so you drill that so many times, it's like second nature. And as soon as that something happens, boom, you can react and do that battle drill. So those are kind of, of, of three different things when it comes to combat. Use your MDMP and troop leading procedures. Have that design mindset that's always thinking, understand the environment, define the problem, come up with a solution. And when you go into a combat situation or when you go to a tough situation in business, you have to have battle drills that are already trained and rehearsed that you, can, you know are going to work the first time a crisis comes up. I think I want to touch a little bit on the piece of humility. Um, I was talking to someone and I thought that this was a, such an interesting perspective and it was another guest on the podcast. And he said that he, he was a, a big uh, chief strategy officer at one of the world's largest marketing research firms. And he said every time that he hired an analyst, he told him, excuse my language, but he said, your job is to tell me when I'm full of shit. And I thought that, wow, that takes such humility 
and it shows the other person that I'm vulnerable as well. I'm not perfect. But how do I get to that point, sir, where I'm willing to say, walk in the door and say, I don't know all the answers because sometimes maybe you can attest to this, sir, but I, I haven't experienced it yet, but I've heard some new officers may come into an organization or a new platoon leader. And there's that NCO that's been there for X number of years, has so much experience, but the new leader may say, I'm the leader. I make the decisions. So how do I get to that point where I, I walk in and I'm like, Hey, I know that I'm, I'm an, I'm an officer. I'm the leader here or whatever, but I don't know all the answers and I have to rely on you to really guide and mentor me. How do I walk into that position yep. and develop that humility? Build opportunities for you to be humble. Put in forcing functions for you to be humble because you're exactly right. As you go up, up, up in rank, it is very easy uh, to kind of sit back and think you know everything. So how do you build an opportunity to be humble? Well, I, you know, starts with PT. Do PT with your soldiers. Work out with your soldiers. That's the one thing we do every day where you can be humbled easily because they will break you off. Uh, and, you'll re and you know what? You'll hear them talking and you'll hear what's on their mind and, and, and you'll be humbled and you'll, you'll be brought back and you'll hear their perspective. Um, there, there's plenty of ways to do that. I always used to say as a, as a young lieutenant, as a young officer, young person in the organization is shared hardship. If your privates are picking up trash, you need to go pick up trash. The platoon sergeant has already picked up trash for 15 years. He, he, he or she knows how to do that. You don't. If they're policing brass on the range, go police up brass with them. Share hardship. You will be humbled because you're going to go, this sucks. I don't like picking up brass and these guys got to do it every single time we shoot on the range and it will humble you. It will humble you. But you got to check yourself and you got to put those forcing functions in or else you're always doing PT with the officers. You're always doing PT with your lieutenant buddies. As soon as the range is over, you're in the range shack in the air conditioning. And, and you won't be humbled. And, and you'll start to get in that, that mindset of, and kind of be inside your own head without getting those inputs from your subordinates um, that you need to keep you, to keep you humble. A lot of times you think you know what's going on. You really don't. And you can only get it by getting out there, getting into the ground, humble yourself, and, um, and spend time at, at their level to remind yourself what it's like to be there. And, uh, but you got to have the forcing functions to do that. Right, sir. So it's more of a deliberate process and actually, like you said, making it a point to get in the mud, get out there and pick up the brass with your soldiers to show them that not only, you know, you care, but it also gives you the perspective on, man, like you said, this stinks and I appreciate that they're doing this. And I want to dive a little more deeper into that because I think that it's important. So I'm a new, and I, I, this is not only specific to new platoon leaders, but also new leaders that come into an organization with people who have been there for X amount of years. So I come in and now I've assumed the role and it's my first day. What should my interaction with my platoon sergeant look like or my new, um, my assistant who's extremely important in, in my function and my role and me being successful? What does that interaction look like? Yeah, again, use the army systems that the army has developed for that situation. The system that the army has developed for that is initial counseling. We have products for it. You're trained on it. If you're a civilian, I'm sure you have initial counseling for that person's evaluation, same type of products. And again, a lot of people don't use it. So what I did and what I've done my whole career is I, ha I do what's called a get to know your counsel. And all I do is sit down and we just talk. And I'll, I tell them where I'm from. I tell them my background. I tell them my hobbies. I tell them my strengths and weaknesses. But then I listen to them say all those things. Where are they from? What's their journey in the army been? What's their family like? What are their goals? Here's the big one. What are their expectations of me as a new leader, right? Before I tell them, this is my checklist for you. You got to do this. You got to do this. I say, what's your expectations of me from a leader? What do we need to change in this organization to be the best? What's your input on how we should train over the next six months, right? 
and you're just getting to know each other back and forth. And then once they've given you their clear expectations, then you can go to them and go, you know what? Here's my expectations of you. I expect A, B, C, and D. But now it's coming from a place where you've, you've really communicated, you've really gotten to know them. The other thing is the non-commissioned officer evaluation report, the NCOER support form, Army system, use it. Nobody uses it. It's a great system. All it is is you are basically writing their evaluation side by side with them. So you say, look, there's five areas you're being evaluated on. Here's what they are. What are we doing over the next year where you can excel in this area? And you sit down there, write it in pencil, and write it down. You want them to be successful. You want to set goals together. And then as you do your quarterly counseling, semi-annual, and your final evaluation counseling, you're using that same product and having a dialogue. And uh, those are two great products as you come in, whether you're a new lieutenant or new in an organization, where you can sit down and use those and get to know the person before you start to challenge them. You've got to care before you challenge, and that's a great way to do it. I think I've, I've, so I've definitely heard the initial counseling way, but I've never heard the NCOER way. So you're saying that when I first come in, is it in that initial counseling that I'm also bringing the NCOER with me? Absolutely. It's an actually, it's actually a different form. It's called the NCOER support form and it's designed for a lieutenant to sit down with a platoon sergeant and go, okay, we have this coming up. What's our goal for this? Well, we want hundred percent qualified and, uh, 100% medical certified, all right? Well, what's your goals for physical fitness? Boom, 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 boom. You write them all down, and then the NCOER, the evaluation, writes itself over the year, and then you can have a discussion and say, hey, man, you know, you said we were going to get 100%. We only got 70%. So that's not a top block. That's a middle block. And, and that use that NCOER support program. It works like a charm. Yeah, that's something that I know is going to benefit a lot of people because I've I've heard of the NCOER support form, but not in the manner that you're talking about. And I think that it really goes back to the, the fact that as, and maybe you can attest to this, but this is something that I was told that sometimes the army does a really bad job of telling people when they do something really good, because we focus on the negative aspect of things so often as you were saying. But I think that if, if you can map out with somebody that this is the end goal and this is how we can get there, right. like you're saying, this, these are the five areas, this is what's coming up, and then this is how we can get there. So then how important is it, and, and this is one of the last things I wanted to discuss, because it's so, it's so important, to, to really understand the goals and aspirations of those that you're leading. Because for me, it's, it's, it seems like it's a matter of, I'm here to really serve you, and how can you really serve somebody if you don't know what's really important to them and their goals and aspirations? I think a, a great way to do that is, is one, you got to have a clear dialogue of the expectations, right? And the Army leader attributes and competencies are so clear. The Army says, if you're a leader, you need to have character, you need to have presence, you need to have intellect, you need to be a leader, leads, develops, and achieves. Six things. And it says that's how we're going to evaluate people. So when you can very clearly lay that out up front, they have the expectations, clear expectations that this is the standard that I'm going to hold you to, then they know this is what I'm being graded on. Because what you're, they're being graded on is what's going to help them get to their goals. So part of it's having a discussion about their goals and understanding where they want to be and, and that you're there to help them get there. But also you want to set very clear standards and hold them accountable to those standards. It's not just a, a free-for-all and everybody's gonna get a, get a trophy. No, you can sit down and say, you know what? We talked about presence being important. You are overweight. You, are, have, a, you have a low PT score. And we talked about that up front and, and you have not met the standard in that area. So you're gonna get this part of, on this evaluation and, and that means you're probably not gonna make your goals. But you know what? We talked about it up front, you knew it, and you didn't accomplish it. And I'm going to hold you accountable for it. And it makes that conversation a lot easier when you put the expectations up front. Yeah, I think that's a really informative piece because it takes away that shock, the shock factor where, what do you mean, sir? What do you mean, ma'am? Because you already, like you said, you laid out 
the standard, the expectation, and also they develop their own expectation because you, they've laid out with you that these are my goals. This is what I want to accomplish. And then if they don't accomplish it, they know that as well. It's not like you said, it's a shock, it's a shock to them. It's not. So the last thing I really wanted to end on, sir, and this is the last question. When you're no longer here, hopefully that's not for a long time. What do you want your legacy to be? And, and what do you want the impact that you left behind to be? I think a first legacy I want to have is as a Christian. Um, you know, there's a, there's a saying that says, um, we've only one life, it soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. So, so what have I done during my time for, for God and his kingdom uh, is the first legacy that, that I want to have. The second is really a, a legacy of my family, uh, is leave, leaving a legacy of, of having a great family, of having a strong marriage that makes it through the test of time, through, through all the highs and lows of marriage. And having two sons who I absolutely believe in, I'm, I'm so proud of them, and, and, but growing them to be, uh, to be leaders and to be men of God and to be um, leaders in their community. Um, so I think a family legacy. And then, and then lastly is a, a leadership legacy. And man, I love seeing my, my uh, former subordinates, my people that I'm a mentor for, watching them grow and develop now they have their own companies. Now they have their own battalions. Now they have their own brigades. And, and knowing that I was a little, a little piece of their growth and development is an incredible legacy of leadership. And, and uh, I look forward and, and hope that I can have that impact. Well, sir, thank you so much. I know that for the past hour or so, you've, you've talked so deeply about leadership, about life, about how to genuinely care for those people that you lead. And I know that it was valuable for me and also other young leaders that are definitely going to listen to this. So I really thank you for sharing your experiences. And it was a really, a really, really good blessing for me personally. Going back to the faith point, I feel like uh, God really enabled me to bring you on here and to share this with the audience. So if anybody is interested, Colonel Lopez, you can find him on Instagram, Lopez on Leadership, also YouTube, and he has really, really good products on there. So I definitely recommend that you guys check him out on there. Uh, but once again, sir, thank you very much for coming on. And I really look forward to staying in touch uh, and keeping you updated as I, as I begin my own journey now. Yeah, thanks for having me. I do have one final message. I got to yeah. rub my Army recruiter badge here and, and say, look, the Army needs you to help us with recruiting. We, we had two months with COVID where we really didn't, didn't do that much for recruiting. We were taking care of ourselves, taking care of our families. But coming up, June 14th is the Army birthday. Uh, June 30th through July 2nd is going to be a big push across the Army called Army National Hiring Days. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a whole Army effort. So we need everybody. When you see content that, uh, that talks about recruiting, talks about joining the Army, specifically about going to GoArmy.com, please share that on your personal, your work, any type of social media you have. Share that content. We want to impact the American uh, public and, and show them all that the Army has to offer. So I ask for all of your help. Thanks for listening today. But uh, help us with recruiting here as we go through the Army birthday and into uh, the July 4th weekend. Well, you guys have heard it here. Colonel Lopez, thank you so much, sir. It was such an authentic conversation. And I feel like I've been impacted and you've, you've developed me as a leader in a short amount of time. So thank you once again. And I really hope that you all enjoyed this episode of the One Life Podcast. Look forward to you all joining me as I go forward and bring to you other leaders of not only in the military, but other areas of life as well. So, sir, thank you once again. I look forward to talking. All right. Thanks, Devin. Thank you guys so much for listening to yet another episode of the One Life Podcast. I hope that you were able to take one or two of these ideas that we discussed today and are able to implement them in your life to make you more successful in whatever it is that you're chasing. Remember, only one life to live, no time to wait, act now. See you guys on the next episode of the One Life Podcast.